Uh, my name is Cameron Hewitt, and uh, I work here at the Rick Steves Europe headquarters. Uh, mostly what I do is I work on guidebooks. I'm a, a researcher and an editor and a writer for our guidebook series. And I collaborated with Rick to write our two guidebooks on cruising in Europe, uh, which I'll talk about here in, in just a moment. Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for coming. And welcome also to folks who are watching this at home, either streaming live today or watching later on YouTube. Either way, we're really happy to have you. I wanted to mention this talk will be very focused on cruise ports. It's very, actually pretty dry. It's not for everybody. Um, it's a class for folks who are definitely going on a cruise. If you're not going on a cruise, it's not great armchair travel because it's very much about the logistics of each port. Uh, make sure if you're here that you have this gold colored handout. And if you're at home watching this on the internet, you can find this handout on our website to download, ricksteves.com. This is really worth its weight in gold. Uh, on one side, you have Mediterranean cruise ports. On the back, you have Northern European cruise ports. And in each case, for the Mediterranean side, which is what we're talking about now, I've listed the most popular ports in Europe. And I've mentioned, yes, no, or maybe, is it our best advice that you would want to take a shore excursion? And that's the big question with this class. Do you want to pay for a shore excursion in each port, or do you want to try to do it on your own? Uh, and this sheet represents um, many, many days and weeks of research on the ground, arriving actually in these ports on a cruise ship and figuring this stuff out. Um, so it's very summarized, obviously. But this is kind of what we'll be following along in this order throughout the talk. All of the details are in much greater depth in the guidebook that this comes from. Let's go ahead and get started and set sail on the Mediterranean. And boy, there are few more appealing places to get on a ship and go for a nice cruise. Uh, this is obviously an area that is made to order, uh, not only for the seas itself, but for the great destinations you can access by a cruise. You've got the spectacular, uh, fantastical architecture of Barcelona. Uh, you've got Florence, the greatest Renaissance history in the world. Of course, you've got Venice Unique, this beautiful uh, watery wonderland of Venice. Uh, cruises are also a great way to reach a little bit more uh, exotic places, places you might not go to on your own, places like Dubrovnik in Croatia. It's very easy to go there on your own, but it's kind of out of the way, and a cruise is a very convenient way to get there. Um, spectacular beauty, you've got the... Uh, Island nation of the islands, sorry, the island of uh, Santorini in Greece, which is perched on the lip of, a, of an old volcano crater. Uh, it's also a great place just to be on vacation. If you go on a cruise, you might enjoy your, your cruise ship's swimming pool, but if you're in port and there's a beautiful beach on the Aegean here in Greece, for example, it's a great way to just enjoy yourself. Uh, and again, exotic places that might otherwise be intimidating or tricky to get to on your own, like Istanbul, are very accessible on a cruise. Uh, this talk is very much tailored for folks, again, going on a cruise who want the best advice for what to do, well, really two things. How to get from the port into town in each place, and uh, what to do once you're in town with the limited time that we know you have. When you walk off your ship, you're always going to have that choice. You can either hop on an excursion bus here on the left, or you can join the gang on the right and walk or take the bus or hop a taxi to go into town and look out for your own trip. Um, uh, I'm not necessarily against excursions. I'm not saying never take an excursion. And I'll mention some cases where it does make sense. But I think you'll find that if you have good information uh, and you really uh, do your homework, you can have a great time on your own and not be at the, at the whim of the cruise line in terms of excursions. We've got two guidebooks uh, that go with this topic. This class that I'm doing right now is about our Mediterranean cruise ports guidebook. Uh, this covers not every single cruise port in the Mediterranean, but certainly the most popular ones, the ones that we think are, are most likely that you'll be going to. And this is a really gigantic book. It's a big brick. It's really thick. We didn't skimp on our information. We've got our full-length uh, walking tours and uh, museum tours for the top sites in Europe. And we expect you, if you're going to buy this, to cut it up into little pieces. I know it hurts, uh, but I'm here to tell you I wrote this book. And I cut this up ruthlessly. You don't, you're not going to hurt my feelings or Rick's feelings if you, if you take an X-Acto knife to this book. It just doesn't make sense to take 100 pages on Florence when you're in, day for the port, in port for the day in Athens or something like that. You want to have only the information that you need so that you can pack light while you're in port. Let's talk about this Mediterranean cruise ports. This is obviously a really popular region. It's certainly the most popular part of Europe in terms of cruising. For the most part, it's divided into two halves, the Eastern Mediterranean and the Western Mediterranean. If you're going on a cruise for seven days or less, you're probably doing one or the other. If you're going for 10 days or two weeks, you might get a taste of each part. Um, but basically, Italy is the dividing line. So this class, we're going to talk about the main ports on each side. In the west, you've got Barcelona in Spain. You've got some ports in, Fran in France, uh, that's Provence and the Riviera. Uh, you've got the west coast ports of Italy, Livorno, Civitavecchia, for Rome, and Naples. And then on the eastern side, Venice is usually used as a springboard for the eastern side. 
Uh, and then from there, you head down to Croatia, Dubrovnik and Split, and then continue on to Greece. You've got Athens, but then you've also got lots of different islands, Mykonos, Santorini, Corfu, Rhodes, um, this sort of thing. And then finally, we'll also talk about Turkey, uh, the capital, that's actually not the capital of Turkey, but the main city of Turkey, Istanbul, uh, and then another port in Turkey that's very popular for cruises, it's called Kushadasa, and it's the port for a beautiful ancient site called Ephesus. So we're going to take a quick spin to each of these. Uh, I already mentioned this, but just to make sure you know, I wish I could linger and tell you all the great stuff to do in Barcelona. We actually do a class sometimes that's an hour and a half just on Barcelona, but this is very targeted, just like your trip is. You've got eight hours in Barcelona, or six hours in Barcelona. This is all about what are you going to do in that time. I'll also try to teach some general strategies for how to handle any port, even if your port doesn't happen to be covered on this particular talk. Uh, Barcelona, it's a wonderful city. If you're going to go to one city in Spain, I think it would be hard to make a case to go anywhere other than Barcelona. It's a great place. For sightseeing perspective, uh, if you have a short time, there's really two areas you might want to focus your time on. One is the old city, the Bari Gotik, right in the core of town. Uh, but you also might want to go a little further out to the district called the Aishampla, there in the upper part of the map. Aishampla means expansion. This is where the city grew when it got too big for its old walls. Uh, very regular grid plan uh, situation out there. The reason you would go to the Aishampla is for those amazing architectural sites of Antoni Gaudi and the other modernista uh, kind of Art Nouveau, local Art Nouveau style. Uh, I'll talk more about all of these as we go, but that just gives you your bearings. There's two kind of zones for your day in port. By the way, if there are a couple of different zones, as is the case in a lot of cruise ports, logically it makes sense to start further out and then work your way back. It's easier to start near the ship and work your way out, but then you risk the chance that when it's time to get back to your ship, there's a traffic jam and it takes longer than you thought and you're stranded far away from your ship. So in this case, the cruise ship docks out, it's just off the bottom part of this map, but there's a really handy little shuttle bus that drops you right at the bottom of the Ramblas. I'll show you a picture in a moment, but the Ramblas is this main pedestrian street through the core of city. From the Ramblas, you can just walk right into the old city, so that's very tempting, uh, and then work your way out to the Aishampla, which is a bit further out. I would suggest maybe flipping that from the Ramblas, take a subway or a taxi or a bus to get out to those farther out sites, work your way back to the old city, then you can linger there confident in the knowledge you're within walking distance of that shuttle bus rather than across town. Think about this no matter where you are. There's that beautiful street called the Ramblas. This is the showpiece pedestrian street running through the heart of old Barcelona. And there is a metro stop right there. When your cruise ship shuttle bus drops you off, you walk about two minutes up the Ramblas, and there's a metro station. So you can hop on this to take the underground train anywhere you want to go in the city, including some of those farther flung sites. If you do want to linger and hang out and see the old city, just explore those charming old streets and squares. And you know, just because you're on a cruise and you're only in town for a short time doesn't mean you can't have an interesting cultural experience. For example, every Sunday morning, in front of the cathedral in the Bari Gotik, the old quarter of Barcelona, they do what's called a sardana dance. This is a very traditional dance for the region of Catalonia, which is the region of which Barcelona is the capital. It's a sub-region of Spain. They have a lot of regional pride. People get together. They hold hands in a circle. They dance around in front of the cathedral. It's a really beautiful thing, and if you happen to be in town on a Sunday. There's no reason you can't have those cultural experiences, even if it's a short visit. Also right there in the old city is a fun market called La Boqueria. It's a great place to go for maybe browsing for a picnic, but also do a little bit of people watching. It's a really fun, lively, somewhat touristy, but also quite local. It's a little bit like Seattle here, uh, our own Pike Place market. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of tourists, but you, uh, there's a real actual local tradition behind it as well. Uh, one of the big challenges when you're on a cruise anywhere is having lunch because you want to have something that's local and authentic, but it also should be fast uh, and you, you don't want to end up at a two hour lunch because you only have a few hours in port. Uh, in each port, I'll try to give you a few strategies for that. It's really easy in Spain because they have this wonderful tapas culture. You can just walk into a bar. Uh, a lot of Barcelona bars are, they would call them Basque style bars where they actually have a nice sort of smorgasbord laid out on the counter of different tapas. A lot of times they'll have a toothpick in each one. You can actually just help yourself, take the ones you want, and then at the end the bartender just counts your toothpick and he charges you a euro or two euros for each one. You can pay your bill and be on the way. Uh, if you do this, it might take 15 or 20 minutes to have a really good filling local meal that's totally authentic. Uh, the temptation I know is to drop into the McDonald's and grab a hamburger. But for the same amount of time and maybe a little bit more money, in most cases, you can challenge yourself to do a little bit better. Uh, and, and in Spain, it's tapas bars. Uh, 
That other kind of cluster of sites that's a bit further out in the Eixample is this wonderful modernista architecture. Antoni Gaudí is a local uh, architect who worked in the early 20th century uh, here in Barcelona, and they have their own distinct breed of Art Nouveau here called Modernisme. Uh, very, uh, very beautiful, very uh, dramatic. Lots of natural curves, um, arches, this sort of thing. Uh, this was Gaudí's greatest work, and it's still unfinished. It's called the Sagrada Familia. But in the last 20 years since I've been going there, they've made a tremendous amount of progress. They've actually finished the interior of this church. Really breathtaking, and unlike anything you'll see anywhere else. And there are a few other Gaudí buildings and other buildings by other modernista architectures, even closer to the center. Uh, this is one called uh, Casa Milá, which is also called the Quarry. Uh, La Pedrera. You can actually tour the inside and go up on the rooftop and see these fanciful chimneys that are designed by Gaudi. I know that was a quick blitz through Barcelona, but that's all that we have time for. And I really think the things I just showed you, you could really see all of that even if you had only six or eight hours in port. It's really possible to do a lot. We're going to talk next about Provence. This is the, one of the ports in the south of France. This is a bit of a complicated one um, because it's not quite what you're expecting. When you think of Provence, you probably think of this picture that I'm showing you, these kind of tranquil hill towns. But actually, the ports that cruises use are big industrial cities that are nowhere near this romantic or pretty. Uh, the two ports are Marseille and Toulon. This is the region of Provence here, and most of the really famous stuff in Provence, which I'll show you a bit later, is up in the northwestern part of this map. And then down along the coast there in the southern strip, Marseille and Toulon, you can see, they're both along the coast. They're about, I think, an hour, maybe 45 minutes apart by train. Um, whether you come into one or the other, you have a couple of choices. You can stay in the town you're in, or you can hop on the train and go somewhere else. Right between these two is an adorable little town called Cassis, and this is just a beautiful little port town that's more romantic than those two big cities, so that's one good option. If you're coming into Marseille in particular, you're pretty close to one of the finest, most beautiful towns or small cities in Provence, Aix in Provence. You can see it's about a 45-minute train ride up to Aix from Marseille. If you have a long enough time in Provence, you can really do one of those things. Uh, and again, if you're confident and comfortable taking your, the train and using public transportation, there's no reason why you can't do one of these things. Uh, there's not, uh, it's not that you shouldn't stay in these towns necessarily. Marseille, for example, is a big city. It's the second city of France. It's the main port city of France. Um, there are a few sites. There's some beautiful churches, some interesting thriving markets. Uh, but for most folks, it's certainly not what they think of when they think of Provence. Uh, Toulon is uh, probably even less interesting, if I'm being honest. Uh, it was like a lot of big ports. It was bombed during World War II and has been rebuilt in a modern style that's not particularly charming. So get on that train. Go to the little town of Cassis, where you can uh, sit out at a cafe, walk around the harbor. And there's also these little uh, inlets called Calanc, where they have beaches hidden away uh, in the countryside along the coastline between Cassis, which you can reach from there as well. Uh, but if I was going to pick one thing to do, particularly if you're coming into Marseille, I would go to this town, Aix-en-Provence. It's just one of those classic uh, Provençal towns, beautiful plain trees, uh, gorgeous architecture, great market, a uh, great place to just go and wander around for a couple of hours. And we've got a self-guided tour of that town in our guidebook as well to help you spend your time. Now, some of the really famous stuff in Provence, you've got, for example, the Pont de Garde uh, uh, aqueduct, which was built in ancient Roman times to supply water to the ancient Roman city of Nîmes. Uh, you've got Avignon with its famous broken bridge in the Palace of the Popes. Uh, you've got the beautiful hill towns of the Luberon region. These are all wonderful sites, but I wouldn't attempt any of these on your own if you're on a cruise ship. This is a case where you might think of an excursion. If you want to hit some of these further afield things, Provence is a region where that's really worth considering. Uh, now we're going to move on to our next French port, which is the French Riviera. Uh, unlike Provence, this is a really easy place to arrive. There's three different ports that receive roughly the same amount of uh, passengers each year, and they're equally easy to arrive at and to connect between. Uh, it's the city of Nice, the small town of Villefranche-sur-Mer, and Monaco, Monte Carlo, uh, its own little independent country there, squeezed between Italy and France. Uh, as you can see, here's the French Riviera, and these three towns line up perfectly up in the northeast, in the upper right corner here. They're connected by each other uh, by about a 15 or 20 minute train ride only. So depend, no matter which one you come in at, you can choose to go to one of the other ones uh, as easily as anything else. Um, so what, what I'm about to show you are kind of some of your options. Just pick and choose what you like and see what you have time for. Hop on the train to connect the, the places that appeal to you. The main city here is Nice. This is uh, this great genteel beachfront city. Uh, it's a great place, frankly, just to go for a walk along the beach. Uh, the cruise harbor is right there at the sailboat harbor. So you walk off your cruise ship and this is what you see. Walk around the harbor and then you can hop on the local tram to get around the city. 
uh, zip through kind of some of the genteel quarters, head up to the train station if you want to connect to one of those other towns. Or go for a walk from where the cruise ships come in. It's a 10 or 15 minute walk into the old town where you can find a thriving market, a really fun place just to go for a stroll. Uh, nice is really known for its modern art, art museum. So you've got a, a Henri Matisse museum and a Marc Chagall museum, both in Nice. If you're a fan of modern art, you could easily spend the day in Nice just going to these two museums. The next town is Villefranche-sur-Mer. This is almost kind of a suburb of Nice. It's just outside of Nice. This is a tender port, so if you're on a cruise, uh, passengers will be tendered into basically a dock right here in the town center. It couldn't be more convenient. And from here, when you walk off your ship, you see this guy enjoying his coffee. If you take the street past him and curve around there to the right, you reach a big, beautiful beach, and you also reach the train station. Very easy for connecting to other places, or again, just for a day at the beach. And then a little bit further down the road, you've got Monaco, the city of Monte Carlo, another tender port. Most cruise ships tender passengers to the end of a pier right here in the heart of town. You can walk around the harbor and just enjoy exploring Monaco here as well. Um, now, keep in mind when you're cruising about the time of day that you're going to be here. For example, the, one of the famous sites in Monte Carlo is the casino. And your cruise ship maybe will get in at 9 o'clock in the morning. And you'll say, let's go to the casino. Well, folks, it's a casino. It doesn't open until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so that might be something you'll have to save for the end of the day. So when you're planning your days, just kind of use a guidebook to figure out when things are open. It can help you be more strategic in, in planning your time. We're going to head to Italy next. And we're going to start off in the port of Livorno. Uh, Livorno is another one of these complicated regional ports. Uh, it's usually marketed as the port for Florence, but it's also close to some other great sites in Italy. Here's Livorno here on the left side of the screen. It's about a half hour train ride from the port in Livorno. Uh, by the way, it's pretty easy to get to the train station. You take a shuttle bus into the town center, then you have to switch to a public bus that's about 10 more minutes to the train station. Once you're at the train station, you've got Italy by the tail. It's about a half hour, oops, sorry, about a half hour train ride from Livorno to Pisa, and uh, maybe another hour or so to Florence. So maybe an hour and a half total from uh, Livorno to Florence. That sounds like a lot, but because uh, cruise lines know that you're probably going far this day, they tend to give you more time in Livorno. Instead of six or seven or eight hours, they might give you 10 or 11 or 12 hours. So it kind of compensates for the time it takes to reach the city. Um, so I would say, yeah, Florence, of course. If this is your one chance to see Florence, absolutely do it. But be aware that there are other alternatives. I really like, uh, of course, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I'm actually going to be going there in a couple of weeks. I'm leaving a couple of days from now to work on our Italy guidebook. Uh, I really enjoy it. And there's another little town that's just a half hour bus or train ride beyond Pisa called Luca, an absolutely delightful hill town. If you've already been to Florence and don't want to go back, or if it just feels too far for you, consider doing something a little bit closer, Pisa and Luca. Uh, but by all means, if you want to go to Florence, go to Florence, uh, the finest Renaissance city anywhere in Europe. Uh, beautiful place, great place just to stroll and kind of let yourself be lost in fantasies of the Renaissance. Uh, wonderful sites. Some of the best museums in Italy are here in Florence. You've got the Academia Gallery, where you'll see Michelangelo's David, and the Uffizi Gallery, which is the greatest Renaissance uh, art gallery that you'll find anywhere. Keep in mind, you will not be here after dark when the Uffizi Gallery courtyard is empty. You will be here at the peak of the day when everyone on your cruise ship is also trying to get into the Uffizi Gallery. And now this is a really critical tip, especially for certain sites. You can show up at the Uffizi and stand in line for an hour or an hour and a half to get in. Or you can spend five minutes before your trip going on the internet and making a reservation for this site and then planning your day around that. And then you show up at the appointed time, and you can walk right in and skip the line. We've got all the details for this in our guidebook. But be aware in these popular places that there are opportunities for skipping the line if you do a little bit of homework and plan ahead. If you want to have a nice meal in Italy, not just Florence, but really anywhere in Italy, again, you don't have to spend two hours at a, a, a five-course lunch. You can just stop off at a cute little neighborhood trattoria and have a plate of salumi and maybe some antipasti, some uh, pickled vegetables, this sort of thing, with some people watching. That's a great half-hour lunch. You've had a great authentic experience. You've seen the world go by for a half hour, and you still have a lot of time left for your sightseeing. Uh, but again, keep in mind, if you don't want to go all the way to Florence, you're just a half hour train ride from the Field of Miracles in Pisa with the famous Leaning Tower. And just a half hour beyond there is an absolutely delightful Italian town called Lucca. It's an old walled town. And it just if you want to go to a place where you're just lost in small town Italy, and that's your idea of a good time, you can spend your day in Lucca. A total of about an hour away from the port. Totally reasonable. Uh, again, if you want to do stuff that's further afield, if you want to go see the rolling hillsides of Tuscany, if you want to go to San Gimignano, if you want to go to Siena, 
if you want to go to the Cinque Terre, these are all wonderful places. I would do an excursion for those. Um, the things I just mentioned are pretty easy by public transit. If you want to get beyond that, it might take a little bit more doing. Our next Italian port is Rome, which is actually the port of Civita Vecchia, another one of these big smoggy industrial ports, about an hour train ride from Rome. The nice thing is from here, your cruise ship shuttle bus drops you off at the entrance to the port, and you walk about 10 minutes, and there's the train station. Very, very easy. Hop on a train, and in an hour, you're in Rome. The big challenge in Rome is how to spend your time. I mean, this is the eternal city. And it could take an eternity to see everything. Uh, I'm going to be updating our Rome book. I'm flying out two days from today on Monday to update our Rome book. I'll be there for nine days. I know you have nine hours, if you're lucky, not nine days. Uh, but I have a plan for that nine hours. And that plan is to be selective, be really thoughtful about how you spend your time and think about which part of the city you want to see. You're not going to be able to see everything. The two main areas that are likely choices are either the ancient sites here in the southeast part of Rome, the Colosseum and the Forum, or the Vatican sites up in the northwest part. And then there's a third zone that's kind of between them. Right in the middle of this is an area that I like to call the heart of Rome. That's where you have all these beautiful squares and fountains and other, other things like that. I would pick one or the other, either the Vatican or the ancient sites. And then if you have additional time, you can wander into the heart of Rome to kill that last hour or two um, before you have to head back to your ship. Uh, trying to do everything is possible, but pretty tight, and you really wouldn't have time to go inside any of the sites. You would just be kind of running past everything. By the way, you'll come in usually at the Termini station, which is here on the right side of the map, and from there you can hop on the subway, and it'll take you anywhere you want to go in the city. There's also a great bus system as well. Again, those two choices, the Vatican, if you want to go see the greatest church in Christendom, walk in and gape up at this gorgeous, gorgeous church. And while you're there, uh, duck around the corner and head into the Vatican Museum, one of the finest museums of art treasures anywhere in the world. The grand finale of that Vatican Museum is the Sistine Chapel. That is a pretty amazing day. Even if you're in town for a few hours on a cruise, you can really squeeze all of this in. The Vatican Museum is another example of a site that suffers from lines and crowds. So be sure to do a little homework and make sure you reserve that site ahead. The other option here in Rome are these ancient sites, the Colosseum, and right across the street, the Roman Forum. This is a, the place to go if you want to get caught up in your imagination of, of the times when uh, toga-clad senators uh, trod these same stones. That's a really, really delightful place to learn about that history. And then right there in the middle of all this, again, a great place to kind of kill any remaining time is the heart of Rome, these beautiful, famous floodlit squares. Uh, right here in the middle of the heart of Rome is one of my favorite ancient sites. It's the Pantheon, uh, an incredibly intact 2,000-year-old ancient temple. Um, again, uh, it would be great to spend the night in Rome, right? The Trevi Fountain, which is just maybe 10 minutes from the Pantheon. The Trevi Fountain is a delight after dark, but if you really have to settle for it, it's not too bad during the day either. You can see a lot even if you're on a cruise ship. Next Italian port would be Naples, uh, the big smoggy city that sits at there at the top of the Bay of Naples. Most ships coming to this area put in at Naples itself. A few of them tendered to the little town of Sorrento, which is directly across the port. I think Naples is a really fun and fascinating city. There's a lot to see. It's very lively, kind of in-your-face place. Also some great museums. If you've got enough time, you can also hop on the train. In about 45 or 50 minutes, you can go out to the ruins at Pompeii, one of the most famous and justifiably so ancient ruins anywhere in the world. Um, so consider that. Uh, so let's talk about what you would do if you came into the port of Naples. Well, the nice thing is the cruise terminal is right downtown. You walk out of the terminal, look across the street, and there you are. That's the castle that marks sort of the center of, of old Naples. The thing about Naples, Rick likes to say that it's, uh, it's sort of the closest thing that Europe has to reality travel. It's a very intense, in-your-face street culture. People live their lives out and about. Um, people hang off of balconies talking back and forth to each other. And I love to just get lost in the streets of Naples, uh, enjoy the colorful markets. My great culinary tip here is this is the birthplace of pizza, and I've never had pizza better than the pizza I've had in Naples. Uh, there's a couple of famous places that we mentioned in our book that you can stop off at. And if it's not too crowded, you can get in and out for a pretty quick and very delicious lunch. There's also a certain gentility between all of the kind of scruffiness of Naples. Um, you've got some beautiful covered galleries, and you've got the spectacular National Archaeological Museum, which is where they have some of the great uh, treasures from the ruins of Pompeii. Um, speaking of Pompeii, this is that stop that's just a 45-minute train ride away from Naples, if you have enough time to squeeze that in. Like with Barcelona, I would say if you want to go to Naples, you might, or sorry, to Pompeii, maybe do Pompeii first thing in the morning, 
and then work your way back to Naples so that you know how much time you have left before you have to go back to your ship. If you do it the other way around, you don't want to get stuck at Pompeii and all of a sudden there's a train strike and you can't make it back. So always kind of work your way back from the farthest point back to your ship. Uh, in any event, Pompeii is a really magnificent ancient site, stopped in its tracks with the eruption of Mont Vesuvius back in ancient times, um, and very well preserved because it was covered under a, a, a giant mountain of ash for, for many centuries. Uh, so if you want to see an ancient site, this is a really good one to choose. I mentioned Sorrento is another port that's occasionally used for this region. Uh, ships just tender you right to a dock right in the heart of Sorrento. From there, you can hop on that train, the same train line that I just mentioned. It's called the Circumvesuviana. Uh, that's a train line that connects Sorrento to Pompeii to Naples. So if you want to from Sorrento, you can head into Naples as well. Uh, our next and final Italian port is the port of Venice, um, and this is a really uh, fun and interesting city to arrive in by cruise ship. It's a little complicated, so let me explain the layout. Uh, you may know that the, the island of Venice, the island city of Venice, is shaped like a fish. So if we're using that metaphor, the cruise terminal is off at the mouth of the fish, off on the far left end of this screen. You basically have two options. From right near where the cruise drops off, you can hop on an express boat that zips around the outside of the fish, to St. Mark's Square. St. Mark's Square is kind of the fish's belly button. That's right where all the sites are. That's probably where you're, you're going to want to head first. Um, so this express boat is really handy and pretty fast. I think it's 25, 30 minutes, depending on the, on the crowds. Your second option is they built a really cool uh, people mover. It's just a little monorail with, with one stop. And from the cruise port, you hop on this people mover, and it takes you to the beginning of the Grand Canal with this, this gorgeous waterway that's kind of the main highway running through the center of Venice. And if you, if from the Grand Canal, you can hop on a Vaporetto water bus and work your way very slowly all the way down the Grand Canal, ending at St. Mark's Square. So you have fast and slow. Uh, the slower option is more scenic. It's wonderful to see the Grand Canal, but if you're in a hurry to get to the sites, you can take that express boat. There's a third option I'll mention here in just a moment. If you do choose to take that Grand Canal, it is one of the most uh, entertaining, I think, boat rides you'll take anywhere in Europe. It's just this churning sea of big Vaporetto uh, water boats and these little gondolas trying to squeeze between them and private ski boats and this sort of thing. Uh, really delightful. Very scenic, a great introduction to Venice. And this is your goal, whether you take that slow route or the fast route, St. Mark's Square. A lot of wonderful sights right here on the square. Uh, you've got St. Mark's Basilica straight ahead there. Right around the corner is the Doge's Palace, the traditional seat of power of the Venetian Republic back when it was its own independent city-state. Uh, lots of really wonderful sightseeing here, even if you just have a few hours. Again, crowd-beating tips are important. If there's an hour-long line in front of St. Mark's Basilica, you may not realize, unless you have a great Rick Steves guidebook, there's a way to get around the line without any advanced preparation. About a half block away, there's a neighboring church where they have a bag check. And the way this is designed is that somebody waits in line for an hour, gets to the front, and gets mad because now they have to go check their bag and come back. So when you check your bag, they give you a little chit that gets you into the front of the line. What they don't know is, even if you haven't waited in that line first, they'll give you the little free pass when you check your bag. So what you'll do is, instead of going to the end of the line, you'll go straight to that church, turn over your bag, they'll give you a get-out-of-jail-free card, you'll walk right up to the front door of St. Mark's and stroll in in front of 200 people who are on your cruise ship with you who didn't have that advice. Again, when you have such limited time, these crowd-beating trips are just essential to get right and to do your homework. That saves you an hour for doing anything else you want to do in Venice other than just standing in that line. I mentioned there's a third option, and actually you can walk all the way through Venice from the cruise port to St. Mark. Uh, I like to walk on the way back. I like to get to the site, see all the stuff, and then give myself, I mean, if a Venetian did it, they could probably do it in 20 minutes. I like to give myself an hour or more and just wander the back lanes of Venice. And here's a tip. 90% of the crowds of Venice are on 10% of the real estate. And if you walk just two blocks in any direction from that St. Mark Square, you're going to have the beautiful... Uh, tranquil canal to yourself. Um, I love walking back, even if I didn't have to, I love walking back from St. Mark's Square to the cruise terminal because it gets you off that main tourist route and enjoying some canals all to yourself. Uh, really, really well worthwhile. We're going to head to Croatia now. Now, um, it's interesting. Croatia's really emerged as a very popular cruise uh, terminal here. The reason is a lot of cruises start in Venice and then head all the way down to Greece and they need somewhere to stop halfway, right? Otherwise, it's a, it's a day at sea, basically. It takes two days to sail or two nights to sail. Uh, 
Um, and so in the last few years, Croatia has gotten incredibly popular because cruise lines need to stick you somewhere halfway between Venice and Greece. Um, the big one is Dubrovnik, which I'll get to in a moment. But because Dubrovnik started getting so crowded, they started steering people to another city that's a couple hours drive away. Uh, and actually, it's a city I like a lot anyway. It's called Split. This is the big kind of capital of this part of Croatia. A big urban city with an absolutely delightful people promenade. Wonderful just to sit out and uh, do some people watching. Incredibly easy to arrive at from a cruise perspective. The cruise port is basically, if these guys drinking their coffee look straight ahead, they'd see your cruise ship about a 10 minute walk away. There's no reason to do an excursion here whatsoever. Um, and it's got some of the finest uh, Roman ruins that you'll find anywhere, not just in Croatia, but really anywhere in Europe. Um, it's the ruins of the, of the retirement palace of the Roman Emperor Diocletian. Um, so it's, it's very well preserved. You can see all the different layers of history here. This is a town where you've got local guides who give walking tours constantly. You just show up on the main square and look around for someone with a sign and pay them 10 or 12 bucks and they'll take you and show you all these amazing ruins. And then you've got the rest of the day to relax. Uh, but the main attraction in Croatia from a cruise perspective and really even not from a cruise perspective, it's just a great city, is Dubrovnik. Um, and this is probably one of the most popular cruise ports on the Mediterranean. I think it's right up there with, with Venice and Barcelona. Uh, and for good reason, it's a spectacular town. It's like a lot of these little small walled towns, coastal towns in Croatia, except it's on a much bigger scale. They call it the Pearl of the Adriatic for the way it juts out dramatically into the sea. Uh, my favorite activity in Dubrovnik is to go for a walk around those city walls you could see in that first picture that encircle the entire town. From here you have this spectacular view over all of these great rooftops, uh, really wonderful. Uh, the main drag of Dubrovnik is the perfect place to sit out and nurse a coffee. Uh, and there's another shot of those city walls where you can go, go for a stroll. Uh, they've also just, uh, you may know, this is a, a lot of detail I won't get into, but uh, uh, Croatia did suffer through a war not too long ago, 20 years ago or so. Um, and Dubrovnik was damaged during the war. So for example, uh, they had a cable car that went up to the mountaintop above Dubrovnik that was destroyed. And you would never know it if no one was there to show it to you. Uh, the city is completely fixed up and they finally, a couple years ago, rebuilt that cable car. So from the old town, you can uh, hop in line and, and zip right up to this mountaintop. From here, you can see three countries. You've got Croatia at your feet, off on your left is Bosnia, and there straight ahead, those mountains are Montenegro, which is where we're heading next as well. Uh, really spectacular. Uh, because Dubrovnik is so crowded, and it's a really ultimately a pretty small town, I would say it's also a place that really suffers from the interest from cruisers. Um, whether I'm on a cruise or traveling there on my own, uh, I have to say I, get, I have a bad attitude about cruising in Dubrovnik because it just gets so crowded and clogged you can barely walk down the main street. Uh, this is another place uh, where you really have to think carefully about um, strategies for avoiding crowds. If you want to walk around the city wall, for example, I would head there first thing because everyone else has the same idea on your ship. So you want to try to be your first person off your ship and the first person in line for those walls and then you'll have it to yourself for a while. Whereas if you wait an hour or a half hour or linger a little longer at breakfast, you'll be right in the mob with everybody else. And if it just gets to be too much, you can also just go to the beach in Dubrovnik. There are some delightful beaches that are just a five or 10 minute walk outside the old town, far less crowded than the streets of the old town itself. Um, in terms of the arrival in Dubrovnik, it's pretty straightforward. Some of the cruise ships tender right there into the old town. Um, in fact, they land right there in the middle of this picture. Uh, there's also a bigger cruise port that's about a 15 minute bus ride away. Either way, it's very easy to do on your own. There's no need to pay for an excursion here. Montenegro, uh, the town of Kotor, is also emerging recently as a popular destination for the same reason Dubrovnik and Split are. Dubrovnik is getting full. Dubrovnik is actually so crowded they're starting to turn ships away. And just about two hours south of Dubrovnik by car uh, is this island, uh, sorry, this, this uh, beautiful, um, it's basically a fjord. It's a dramatic inlet called the Bay of Kotor. And this is something that's turning up in the last few years more and more on cruise itineraries. Another very, very easy place to arrive. First of all, it's one of the most dramatic sail-ins or sail-aways anywhere in the Mediterranean because you're going through what basically feels like a Norwegian fjord, but it's down in the Adriatic. Uh, and then the ship deposits you right across the street from the old town where you can explore the charming streets. And if you want to, you can hike up on the fortifications that are on the hill directly above it. Um, so this is a place that I think is just, we, have, we don't even have it in the current edition of our guidebook. This is kind of a new thing, but we're going to move in that direction because it's becoming extremely popular. All right, we're going to head down to Greece now and talk about a few of your options there. Starting with the capital of Greece, Athens. Uh, the port for Athens is a separate city that's kind of a suburb called Piraeus. 
And you can say this along with me, it's a big, dreary, ugly, sprawling port city, uh, but it's pretty convenient to get from here into the city center. Um, I would say Piraeus is one of the more chaotic and confusing ports that I've seen, partly because it's not only cruise ships, but it's also where a lot of passenger boats come and go um, to all parts of Greece. So it's just kind of a mess. Um, this is a place where you might consider, I have a maybe in the column for this one on your sheet, you maybe want to consider an excursion here because it's a little bit chaotic to arrive, and there are some great ancient sites that deserve a great tour guide to explain them to you once you get into Athens. If you do want to do it on your own, it's doable. It's just maybe one notch more complicated. There's also multiple different cruise ports that you can arrive at within Piraeus. Some of them, there's a direct bus. Some of them, you have to walk to the subway. There's always a public transportation or affordable taxi route to get into the city, uh, but it can be a little complicated. 20, 30, 40 minutes, depending on traffic. Once you're in the city, though, uh, it's very compact, very easy to see on your own or with a guide. Uh, of course, most people set their sights on the Acropolis, this beautiful hilltop um, that is the centerpiece of Athens, ancient Athens like modern Athens. And at the base of that is a beautiful old town called the Plaka that's fun to explore as well. Surrounding that is kind of an ugly urban sprawl, but the core of Athens is very charming and pleasant. And of course, the centerpiece of that Acropolis is the Parthenon, one of the greatest and most intact temples of the ancient world. And then at the base of the Acropolis is a whole other set of sites. This is the ancient Agora, the old marketplace, the gathering place. So this was where Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and all of the famous ancients would sit out and, and argue philosophy under the shadows of the, uh, of the Parthenon and the Acropolis. Uh, as I mentioned, it's extremely compact. So it's really easy to see everything I just showed you in just a couple of hours, uh, three hours maybe, once you're in the city of Athens. Uh, it doesn't take forever to get around. There's also a brand new state-of-the-art museum right next to the Acropolis. Um, uh, that has some of the statues and excavations from the, from the uh, Acropolis and Parthenon area. Uh, really delightful. And if you have a little extra time and want to see something else, uh, the best museum of classical sculpture that I've seen in Greece and probably in the world uh, is the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. That's just a 10-minute taxi ride from the ancient agora that I just showed you. Um, so once you're in the city center, it's really easy to see on your own. But these are great ancient sites, and they do deserve uh, thoughtful interpretation. So this might be a place to consider either a cruise line excursion or possibly hiring your own local guide um, to help you appreciate these sites. All right, let's go on vacation. Let's go for the fun ports of Greece. Uh, Athens doesn't have a lot of fun to it. It's a pretty intense sightseeing, ancient sites kind of situation. Uh, but there are also a wide variety of delightful Greek islands where you can just relax be on vacation, take a vacation from your busy vacation. There's not a lot of sights to see, even if you wanted to. It's all about ambiance and wonderful beaches. Um, you can rent, for example, a little uh, ATV uh, from where you come in on your ship and zip around the islands that you're on to find the, the most secluded beach that you can. Uh, I love to just take it easy and go for a photo safari. You can go looking for cute cats. Sometimes when I'm in Greece, I prefer looking for cute old men because there's lots of those as well. And uh, something I would say about Greece islands, I'm really impressed. These are really small towns, and you would think very provincial, very kind of closed towns. They really take all of this stuff in stride. A town like Mykonos um, has as many people as live in the town show up every day on cruise ships. And these old guys sit out at their cafe one way or another and just watch it all go by and, and do a really wonderful job of taking it in stride. Um, these are places that manage to stay as unspoiled as possible, considering the enormous volume of people who are coming through. A couple of specific islands I wanted to talk about. One is Mykonos. Uh, I just alluded to it a moment ago. It's sort of the classic Cycladic island. It's this beautiful whitewashed houses, uh, tranquil harbor. Mykonos is famous for its row of windmills that sit up on the hilltop overlooking the harbor. And it's a, just, a, again, a great place to be on vacation. There's a couple of options on your cruise in Mykonos for how you would arrive. Sometimes you're tendered directly to this pier that sticks out right from the town center. That's simple, right? You walk off your tender and you're right there and in 30 seconds walk, you're in the heart of town. There's also a big modern cruise port that's directly across the bay, basically where this kid's skipping stones. If you look straight across the bay, there's a big cruise ship uh, port, but there's a free shuttle bus that you just hop on. It drives you five minutes around the bay and also drops you right in the town center. So this is another place. I'm not sure why you take an excursion here. It's a very easy place to appreciate and enjoy on your own. A unique place that's very exciting, Santorini. Uh, I would say Mykonos and Santorini are the two most popular islands, uh, Greek islands, from a cruise perspective. 
uh, and for good reason. Santorini is just absolutely spectacular. It's perched on the lip of a caldera, which is basically a volcano crater. You can see as an aerial view, um, this was once a big round island that blew its top uh, 4,000 years ago. And it's sort of like if you flooded Mount St. Helens, it might look something like this, and that's exactly what happened. And you've got little towns perched all along these cliffs overlooking it. Absolutely stunning, and when you come in on your cruise ship, it's really dramatic to go right into the middle of this, of this cauldron, right in the middle of where you can imagine this eru eruption happened. In terms of cruise arrival, this is a little complicated, worth knowing what your options are here. Uh, cruise ships all tender here. There's not really a dock anywhere, um, so you're going to have to ride to tender into the, the port. If you pay for an excursion, they actually take you to a different port that's a little bit around the ridge here. Um, that's a place where buses can come down and pick you up. Uh, but if you're getting off on your own, they'll tender you to a little tiny port that's just at the base of the main town, which is called Fira. To get from the base of that town up into the town itself, there's two options. There's a funicular that goes up and down continuously, uh, and then there's a donkey path. And you can either pay for somebody to put you on their donkey and ride you up to the top, uh, or you can hike up on your own. Uh, I've been warned that, I haven't done this, but I've been warned that if you hike up the donkey path, you will know that you're on a donkey path. It's uh, very fragrant, is what I've been told, and you're constantly being kind of nudged aside by, by beasts of burden, so be careful of that. On the other hand, the problem with this funicular that I just mentioned, um, I used to know the statistics. I think it can take something like 50 people for each departure, and it goes up and down every five minutes. And if there's three ships with 2,000 people each on it, you do the math. You might end up having to wait around quite a bit to even get on the funicular. Um, so you might consider giving up and just hiking up the donkey path, but just be aware um, that it's not necessarily uh, as easy as it sounds. It's pretty steep, and it's also not particularly pleasant. Sometimes you just have to deal with those crowds. Hey, this is another example, like in Dubrovnik, get an early start. Um, if, depending on how your cruise ship works, you can usually get a tender ticket uh, at a certain time. They might say, come by at 10 o'clock the night before if you want to pick up your tender ticket. Try to get in at the front of that line, get on the first tender, uh, and that'll help you avoid the, the big crowds waiting to go up the funicular. Uh, another important tip about the island of Santorini when people think of Santorini, they think of this, right? These beautiful dome churches, whitewashed, colorful, so forth. Um, you might be surprised because you're arriving at this town of Fira, and when you come up to the top, it's a very pleasant town. It's very beautiful, very charming, but it's not quite that over-the-top romance that you're picturing. Uh, there's a good reason for that. It's not the town you're thinking of. There's another town that's about a half-hour bus or taxi ride away um, around at the tip of the island called um, Ia. It's spelled O-I-A, but it's pronounced Ia. Um, so if you're in Santorini for a few hours and you're looking for this kind of a romantic scene, you might want to hop a bus or a taxi and make sure to get to Ia. Uh, Santorini and Ia in particular are famous for being great places to watch the sunset. Um, so if you'd like to do that. What's interesting is uh, Santorini is such a popular cruise port that they have to stagger cruise arrivals. So about half of the cruise ships come in in the morning, let's say from 8 o'clock to 2 o'clock. And then there's a second wave of cruise ships that comes from about 2 o'clock to 10 o'clock. Um, there's not a lot of cruise ports where you're going to get to see the sunset, especially if you're going in the summer when the days are long. But here in Santorini, if you're in that late shift, you might have a great chance to actually enjoy that sunset um, from the beautiful town of Ia. There are lots of other Greek islands, and I would say the advice is similar for all of them. Just relax, enjoy yourself. I wouldn't do an excursion basically at any of these places. Uh, usually it's an easy bus or taxi ride to get into the town. You've got the island of Corfu. Um, you've got uh, Crete, Heraklion. Uh, this is, by the way, one place where you might consider an excursion. Uh, Heraklion is the big port city uh, for the big island of Crete. There are some great sites in Heraklion. There's an excellent ancient sites uh, museum right in the town center. And then there's a palace called Knossos Palace, which is just outside of the town center. You can get to each of them by taxi on your own, but to be efficient, this is a place where you might consider doing an excursion, just to make sure you get to, to see everything, because there's not just one thing to see. It's going to take a little bit of getting around. Uh, Rhodes is another Greek island. Advice, again, similar for Corfu or for Mykonos. Just hop off your ship, walk into town, and enjoy yourself. Take a vacation from your vacation. The last country that we're going to go to has two different ports, and that country is Turkey. Uh, Istanbul is another one of the big cruise ports. And by the way, uh, this is the port where you're very likely to have an overnight. Um, this is a, a something that's happening more and more with a lot of cruise itineraries. Uh, in other words, your ship will actually spend a night in port and then leave after the second day. 
And that's great. You can treat your cruise ship as, the hot as a hotel then. You're not under any, under any pressure on that first day to get back to your ship at a certain time. You can just take it easy, go back anytime you want, um, and it's a great city that really deserves two days. So if you have two days in, in Istanbul, that's really a bonus. Most of the sites in Istanbul are focused on the Old Town Peninsula, which you see sticking out here. And boy, for such a big city, I mean, this is a huge city. I think it's something like 14 or 15 million people, depending on how you measure it. It's surprising how easy it is for cruise passengers. The cruise ships put in right here at these cruise terminals that are just across the Golden Horn from this Old Town Peninsula, where most of the sites are. So depending on which terminal you come in at, you could walk somewhere from 5 to 15 minutes to this beautiful bridge called the Galata Bridge. I'll show you in a moment. And there you can either hop a tram or walk to get into the Old Town and see the sites. Very, very simple. Uh, this is a place where you might feel like you should take an excursion. It feels very exotic. I'm not sure if it's safe. I don't know how I'm going to get around. It's such a big city. Um, I would say you might be surprised how easy it is to do this one on your own. So give that some serious thought. Uh, that's a picture of the Golden Horn, which is this waterway that kind of sticks into the middle of Istanbul, right where your cruise ship gets off. You reach the Galata Bridge that I showed you on that map. It's a popular place for local fishermen, so it's kind of a fun people-watching area as well. Uh, but there's also a tram stop right there. You hop on the tram and you ride at three stops and you pay $1.50, and it drops you off right on the main square of the old town of Istanbul. It really couldn't be easier. From that main square of the old town of Istanbul, which is an area called Sultan Ahmet, you've got no shortage of wonderful sites. You could fill hours, literally, just seeing the sites that are within a five-minute walk of where that tram drops you off. Uh, for one thing, you've got the Hagia Sophia. Now, we think of Hagia Sophia as a mosque. Um, but what's really interesting about it is it was actually built as a church um, and was later converted to a mosque. But it was such an important mosque and so influential that later mosques were modeled after this. But there's this kind of funny irony that mosques around the world are modeled after a mosque that's actually uh, a, a, an Orthodox church built by the Roman Emperor Justinian. So it's, a, it's, a, it's these layers of history are really fun to tackle, uh, even if you're in, in, in town for just a really short day. Stepping inside the Hagia Sophia, you get a, a full scope of the grandeur of the place. So it's really something special. Another great thing to do if you're a shopper, I haven't talked much about shopping uh, so far in this talk. There's lots of opportunities in every town. Uh, when my wife and I did a Mediterranean cruise a couple years ago, we sort of did a one-stop shop here at the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul. It's a really fun, lively, energetic, animated place to go shopping. Lots of uh, very affordable and uh, vividly colorful things to, to shop for. Reasonable prices. It's obviously quite touristy, uh, but it's such a gigantic uh, marketplace that it's, it's also got a lot of really interesting local corners as well. We have a self-guided walking tour of this Grand Bazaar in, in the cruising guidebook if you'd like to follow that as well. Uh, just downhill from the Grand Bazaar, you've got the Spice Market, which is a different, but a smaller, more claustrophobic, but equally kind of vivid and crowded place where you can do some people watching and maybe do a little shopping, uh, stock up on spices um, for when you want to cook some Turkish food back home. You never know what you're going to find at one of these markets in Turkey. Uh, speaking of, uh, as we have in a lot of ports, of getting local food, uh, Turkey is a great place for that as well. There's a lot of kind of cafeteria-style restaurants, so it's very easy to just walk in, point to what you want. It doesn't even matter if there's a language barrier. You just see what's simmering, point to what looks good, they'll fill up your plate, you pay at the cashier, and you've had a really delicious, memorable, flavorful Turkish meal in a really quick way that lets you move on and do some more sightseeing. Of course, before you move on, it's probably a good idea to charge up with a Turkish coffee. You know, this is this style of talk coffee that uses a really finely ground coffee that is unfiltered. Um, so it kind of creates a mud in the bottom of the cup. Uh, and you can, of course, have that with some baklava. It's a really nice combination and a memorable taste treat uh, here in Istanbul. Uh, the final port that I'm going to be talking about here in uh, the Mediterranean is Ephesus. Ephesus isn't the port, it's the, it's the way it's marketed because that's the main site you would see. Uh, pr predominantly, when ships are going to Ephesus, they're landing at the dock of Kushadasa. Uh, there's another uh, place called Izmir where you sometimes land to go to Ephesus. But I'll focus on Kushadasa because that's where most cruises go if they're going to Ephesus. Uh, this is the city of Kushadas. It's pretty big, bustling, and actually kind of a fun to explore port city. Um, if you've seen Ephesus five times already, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world just to hang out in, in Kushadas and do some people watching and, and shop in the bazaars. But of course, almost everybody here does want to head out to that spectacular site. Uh, it's a really easy port to arrive at as well. It's, uh, you just dock right in the town center, 
walk off the ship, head up the gangplank, uh, walk out the, the door, and uh, you're at the, at the main part of, of Kushidasa. Uh, now, there is a public transportation option for reaching the site of Ephesus. I wouldn't strongly recommend it. It's possible, and I've described it in our guidebook if you want to try it. Uh, but it requires a little bit more of an adventurous spirit. Basically, you have to take a shared minibus, which is a very common system for transportation there. Uh, you hop into a shared minibus to a different part of the city where you switch to another shared minibus that drops you off on a country road from which you can walk 10 minutes up to the site of Ephesus. Uh, I did this just to try it out, and I had a, had a good time. But it took longer than if I had just bought an excursion. So this is a place where you might consider buying an excursion just for the efficiency of it, especially from a transportation standpoint. The other thing is an excursion equips you with a good local guide who can help you understand and appreciate the very important uh, ancient city of Ephesus. Uh, of all the city's ancient sites I've seen around Europe, uh, this is one of the most striking. This is the one where I feel like maybe right up there with the Roman Forum and maybe Pompeii, I can really imagine that this was a real city, a thriving city. It's intact enough that you can pretty easily mentally erase all of those tourists and replace them with toga-clad uh, senators. And next thing you know, you, you've been transported uh, to the ancient world. It's really a, a really a wonderful site and well worth seeing. Uh, the centerpiece of the site of Ephesus is the Library of Celsus, kind of the, the main landmark there. If you do an excursion, I promise you it will include a carpet demonstration. And Kushidasa is the port, really, in all of Europe, in all of uh, the Mediterranean, where you're going to get the hardest sell on the carpet thing. Um, and I would say this can actually be a really fun and very educational experience if you're kind of forced into it with your excursion. Uh, it's really uh, uh, interesting to learn about this truly important cultural uh, piece of, the, of, the, of, of Turkish culture. You really get a sense of why carpet making is important, why they've been doing it for so long, how it's done. You have an appreciation for the artistry that goes behind it. Um, keep in mind that any carpet you buy here, though, is dramatically marked up. Uh, not only if you're there with an excursion, it could even be if you're there on your own. Um, that's because the cruise lines have kind of an arrangement with the carpet sellers of Kushidasa. Uh, I've been told by a, a local guide who I know there, who told me that uh, some of the carpets in Kushidasa are marked up as much as 60% with a kickback that goes right back to the cruise line. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, obviously, like in all of Turkey, prices are soft, so don't be afraid to try to bargain them down a little bit. Um, and even if you bargain them down, your cruise line is still going to get a big chunk. And again, even if you're not doing it with your tour guide or if with an excursion, they know which ship you're on. They can tell. They know what ships are in town, and they're going to go ahead and pay your cruise line whether or not uh, you've officially told them I'm on this cruise ship. There's no way to get out of paying this, this surcharge. So just be aware of that. I'm not saying don't buy a carpet in Kushidasa. Um, what I'm saying is uh, do your homework ahead of time. If you love the romance and the sentimental connection of having bought it from the person who made it in Kushidasa, that's well worth the extra expense. Um, but I've done a little research and I found that you can often find a really good carpet of a similar quality for a similar price right here locally in Seattle or, or somewhere in the US. Um, so uh, just be aware that, that that big chunk that's taken out for the cruise line is passed right on to you. But again, it can be still a really fun experience just to go through the sales pitch. Folks, I hope this has been helpful. I know this has been a really whirlwind trip through the Mediterranean cruise ports. And uh, I hope at least you've been inspired to know that if you want to, and this is what I really want to drive home here, if you want to, uh, and if you equip yourself with good information, there's no reason why you can't visit all of these ports on your own independently. Uh, and that will let you do it more cost effectively and let you be your own tour guide and do exactly what it is that you want rather than what the cruise line wants you to do. Um, I hope you have a wonderful cruise to Europe, to the Mediterranean, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.